Thank you for joining us for the Victory Podcast today. Today's podcast is from April 14th, 2019. Join us as we continue our series on spiritual disciplines with Pastor Josh. Psalm 19, we're going to start in verse 7. Psalm 19, verse 7, we're going to look at 7 through 11. 7 through 11. Yeah. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. That is the word of our Lord. So the last time that I, I, I spoke for you guys, uh, we discussed spiritual disciplines. And we looked at what spiritual disciplines are and why spiritual disciplines are important. And we're going to work through this series together. Um, so we looked first at what spiritual disciplines are. And as a way of reminder, spiritual disciplines are those things that are done regularly and repeatedly that produce a right attitude about God and toward God and result in godly living. That's what we said the definition of spiritual disciplines is. And then we also looked at, at three reasons why spiritual disciplines are important. First, we saw that, that spiritual disciplines are important because they have a purpose, they have a goal, and that goal is godliness. Then we saw that spiritual disciplines were important because they have value. And this isn't a temporal value, it's an eternal value. And then finally, we saw the spiritual disciplines are important because they have a motivation or a catalyst. And that catalyst is God. So today, I want to take a look at one of those things that we can do regularly and repeatedly that will result, that will produce a right attitude towards God and about God, and that will result in godly living. Today, we're going to look at Bible intake as a spiritual discipline. And I'm starting with this one because I just believe this is a natural place for us to start. It is foundational. God has revealed himself to us through his word. And in order for us to know him, we must be in his word, take in what is in his word. So first off, notice I said the spiritual discipline of Bible intake, not Bible reading. Um, Bible intake. Um, and I did this on purpose because there are many ways that you can take in God's word. There's many ways you can take on, in God's word to have it penetrate you, to have, have it change you. And for instance, if, hearing God's word as we are now, hearing God's word proclaimed, it, listening to God's word is a way that you can uh, be in God's word. We see a wonderful example of this in Nehemiah 8. Ezra grabs the book of the law and he, he goes out in front of all the people. They gather and he proclaims the word of God from early morning to midday, it says. And he has people, men, go out and explain the meaning of God's word and give the sense of what he was saying. And it ends with the people rejoicing because, as it says, quote, they had understood the words that were declared to them. What we see is the true words of God were spoken, the people listened, and they rejoiced. So listening to God's word. We are also called to meditate and memorize God's word. Um, psalm, 1, psalm 119, uh, Josh read part of that. It's a very long psalm, but a wonderfully beautiful song about God's word. Um, in it, it tells us, I will, it says, I will meditate on your precepts. Meditate. And he says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So the psalmist here, he's meditated upon God's word, God's word, and he has stored it up or memorized God's word. Ultimately, though, we must read and study God's word. Christians must be people that are in God's word repeatedly, regularly, and constantly. As I said, it's, a, it's, a, it's profitable, it's good to hear the word of God proclaimed, but we have to be 
in our Bibles ourselves. We must be like the Bereans who searched the scriptures to see if what they were told was true. So we must be in the Bible for ourselves, reading and studying. So the spiritual discipline of Bible intake takes on many forms, listening, um, meditating, memorizing, reading, studying. In our text today, it's not going to show us how to do each one of those things. Um, that's not the purpose of the text, and that's not the purpose of this message. Um, it's my prayer that through this text, we will see that Bible intake as a spiritual discipline is profitable because we're going to see that God's word is to be earnestly desired because it is fully sufficient. God's word is to be earnestly desired because it is fully sufficient. Understanding that God's word is sufficient for salvation, understanding that God's word is sufficient for transformation, understanding that God's word is sufficient because of its essence, what it, what it is, that should create in us a desire for it. God doesn't want us to come uh, to his word as a duty or as a task or a spiritual discipline that we are to slog through. He wants us to desire his word because of what it is and what it does. He wants us to desire, desire his word because of who it points to. So let's look at our text today and we'll see exactly what it is and what it does. So as we enter our text, Psalm 19, 7 through 11, we're going to tackle it basically in two sections. Verses 7 through 9 describe what God's word is and what God's word does, thereby revealing to us that it is, in fact, fully sufficient. Then the second section, verses 10 and 11, they're going to show us that God's word is to be earnestly desired because of what it is and what it does. Okay? So if I could get the slide change, there we go. I kind of color-coded it for you to make it easy. So this first section, it's an interesting piece of Hebrew poetry. Um, you will notice that it has a very defined structure. Each statement contains a noun that is synonymous with the word of God. Those words are law, testimony, precepts, commandment, fear, and rules. Then each of these nouns is followed by an adjective that describes the word of God. So we see here, perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, and true. Then, after identifying and describing the word of God, each statement has a verb or a description that tells us what the word of God does. And we have reviving, making wise, rejoicing, enlightening, enduring, and righteous. <clears throat> So you'll notice that, that each verse also contains two statements. This structure is called parallelism. And this is a, a popular tool employed in uh, poetry, specifically Hebrew poetry. The poetic de device is usually used to either compare and contrast, or as it's used here in, in our psalm, it's used to repeat and emphasize. Okay? So to try to simplify this, each verse contains two statements that are different but they're actually emphasizing the same point. Okay? So let's just dig in. Verse 7. <clears throat> the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. In this parallel, the word of God is identified as law in the first half and testimony in the second half. Right? One thing I want us to notice in all of these parallels that, that identify God's word in verses 7 through 9 is that each of them can be taken as a, as a very specific part of God's word or a more general part of God's word. So if we look at, for instance, the word law. Law in the Hebrew is the word Torah. And Torah um, is often spoke, used to speak of the first five books of the Bible that Moses wrote, and they contain laws, right? Um, but there's another way that it's used. The Torah also means teaching or instruction. So this kind of speaks more to the totality and more of a general statement uh, because the whole of God's word, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, is the teaching and instruction of God to his people. So we see that there's a specific instance as far as the law being the Torah, 
a very specific instance, and then there's a, a more general aspect as the words of God, to refer, refer to the words of God. So the psalmist says that the law or teaching of the Lord is perfect. It is perfect. It is whole. It is complete. It is blameless. blameless. It is without blemish. It contains everything that God has ordained to reveal to us, and it's lacking in nothing. The first half of verse 7 describes this perfect teaching of the Lord as reviving the soul. That's what it does. It, it revives the soul. But what exactly does that mean to revive the soul? How does God's teaching revive the soul? This is speaking of salvation. The Hebrew word here for reviving is most often translated as returned or turned back. And this is literally, say, literally saying that the word of God, his teaching, it returns the soul. It turns it back to that to which it has turned away from. All have turned from God, and the law of the Lord is perfect and complete because its teaching turns the wayward soul back to God. I like how the King James, the King James Version actually translates this. Instead of reviving the soul, they translate it as converting the soul. And I think that translation might be a bit better at getting at what's being said here by the psalmist. And then we see this same exact thing in the next statement, the next parallel statement in the second half of verse 7. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The testimony, the, the, the decree, the words of God are sure. This means that they are firm, they are faithful, they are trustworthy. So what are they trustworthy and faithful to do? Well, to make wise the simple. They're trustworthy to impart knowledge and wisdom to people who have no knowledge and no wisdom. The testimony of the Lord is able to make the blind see. Verse 7 is simply, yet powerfully, telling us that God's word is sufficient for salvation. God's instructions, God's decrees that he has revealed to us in scripture are perfect and sure. They are sufficient to turn back or to return this wayward soul to the one who created it. It is sufficient to make wise the simpleton. And this is this is good news because God's word tells us the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God tells us everything that needs to be known regarding salvation in his word. The word of God tells us who God is. He is completely and utterly holy. He is the sovereign creator and sustainer of, of the universe. He is the righteous father who is a just judge, whose ways are perfect and immutable. The word of God also tells us conversely who we are. That we were created for a purpose and that, that we've rebelled against God and his purpose. That we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. That there is no way that we can remedy this situation by ourselves. And that God's righteous judgment rests upon us. But here's the great news. The word of God also tells us who Jesus is. Jesus is the son of God, fully God and fully man who became like us, taking on flesh, living a perfect sinless life that we cannot live, dying a sinner's death, taking upon himself the wrath of the father that was meant for us, buried and raised, declaring death, declaring victory over sin and death, sitting at the right hand of the Father, constantly interceding for us. The word of God is fully sufficient for salvation. Let me give you just a couple of verses that should, I hope, drive this home. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 23. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God born again through the living and abiding word of God. James 1.21 says, receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Implanted word, save 
your souls. The word of God is sufficient for salvation. Souls are revived and the simple are made wise. It's only through the word of God that we can be led by the spirit to know the word God, Jesus Christ. So how does the fact that the word of God is sufficient for salvation pertain to spiritual disciplines? Well, we said that spiritual dis disciplines are those things that produce a right attitude about God and towards God. A true understanding of salvation, understanding who you are and understanding who God is and understanding what he has done on your behalf will most certainly produce a right attitude about God and toward God in the life of a true believer. Reading scripture is a way that we can be preaching the gospel to ourselves. It's important that we are regularly and repeatedly reminding ourselves of the wonderful truth of the gospel. Now in our next parallel, parallelism, well, we see that not only is God's word sufficient for salvation, but God's word is sufficient for transformation. Verse eight, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. So in the first half of this verse, the word of God is identified as precepts. Uh, precepts are rules and directions. In his word, God has given us rules and directions. Most simply put, directions are instructions that are given to guide someone to a desired destination or desired outcome. In his word, God has given us not only all that we need for the destination of salvation, but also the rules and directions of godliness. And godliness, as we've talked about previously, is the goal or the purpose of spiritual disciplines. His word shows us how to be sanctified, how we are transformed into the image of Christ. And the psalmist says that those directions are right. These precepts, these rules, these directions, they are correct. They will not lead anyone who follows them to any other place or to any other outcome other than the one that is desired. Many of us have GPS today. We have it on our phones. We have it in our cars, right? And all we have to do is punch in where we're going, our destination, and hopefully we get there. But um, I have been led astray by GPS before. It wasn't my fault, I promise, right? Sometimes the software is not up to date. Sometimes there's a glitch in, in the software, right? And so it ends up taking you to the wrong place. And when I was thinking about this, um, this reminds me of The Office is one of my favorite shows. And there's an episode where where um, Michael Scott and Dwight, they're driving in a car and they got the GPS on and the, and the directions are a little bit vague and they're arguing about which way to go and they end up driving it right into a lake, right? Um, which is funny, but I actually read an article recently about a man that took a right turn because the GPS told him to at night and he ended up in the lake, right? But here's the point. Here's the point. God's word, its precepts and its directions are perfect. It will not only get you to the final destination, but its precepts will direct you in the way that you are to go. These precepts are right, and they're described as rejoicing the heart. They produce joy in the heart of those who hear and act on these directions. When someone truly encounters the word of God through the power of the spirit, the laws, the rules, the precepts of the Lord, they're no longer seen as burdensome or oppressive. Rather, the heart rejoices because of the word of God. The word of God transforms. Now in the parallel statement here, it says in the second half of verse eight, it says uh, that the word of God is the commandment of the Lord. And it's, it's said to be pure. The word of God is pure. It is without blemish. It is described as enlightening the eyes. This phrase, enlightening the eyes, it has kind of like a, a nuanced meaning. Similar to the, its parallel statement, rejoicing the heart, enlightening of the eyes speaks to making the eyes bright with joy. The eyes shine and they're bright when they are refreshed and when they are joyful. 
I, I love watching children play. And when I think of this in, uh, brightening of the eyes, that's kind of what I think about. When children are enthralled and delighting in whatever it is they are doing, their eyes kind of take on a different quality, don't they? They, they shine. And their eyes shine and, and they're bright. And the word of God does that very thing to those who encounter the truths and the realities contained in the word. Then, in a related way, the word of God enlightens the eyes by making us aware and able to, to discern what is seen. The eyes are that which takes in what is presented before them, and when they are enlightened, they're able to make sense of what is seen. And the word of God does just that as well. When believers are led by the Spirit, the word of God is a light upon the world and things can be seen clearly. Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It is only by the word of God that we can know what is right and what is wrong. God's word is given to us so that we may discern truth from error. Most importantly, when we are enlightened to our, to our sin, when our eyes are enlightened, we're enlightened to our sin, and initially that brings us to Christ. But then we are continually enlightened to see our sin so that we turn from it and seek to live in a way that is glorifying to God. Matthew Henry says that these commandments of the Lord, quote, are the means which the Holy Spirit uses in, light, in enlightening the eyes. They bring us to a sight and a sense of our sin and misery and direct us in the way of duty. The word of God is sufficient for transformation. When a person truly encounters the right and pure word of God, they are changed. Their hearts are realigned and their hearts rejoice in the commandments and the directions of the Lord. They no longer look upon the word of God as a fairy tale or a taskmaster, but as a fountain of joy and delight. Additionally, when the eyes are enlightened and the word of God brings its light to shine upon them, the world, shine upon the world, we can see the way clearly. We know the way that we must go. We, we become aware of what God hates and our hearts truly rejoice at those things that God loves. The word of God is sufficient for transformation. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of jo joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It will change you. It must change you. D.L. Moody said, the Bible was not given for our information, but for our transformation. While there certainly is valuable information in the Bible, right? It's not meant only to inform. It's meant to transform. We must be in the word of God regularly and repeatedly because a heart that is rejoicing and eyes that are enlightened will produce the right attitude about God and toward God. When you are confronted by the true, pure word of God, it will result in godly living because of the transformation it produces. Therefore, we have to examine ourselves. See if the word of God is transforming you. If you have a difficult time finding joy in the Christian life, chances are that you've neglected the regular listening, reading, and studying of God's word. You have become distant from the glorious truths and realities that are contained in God's word. If you find that you're having a tough time um, recognizing what path you're on and discerning the way in which you are to go, you may have wandered from the right directions and pure commandments of the word of God. The word of God is sufficient for salvation. The word of God is sufficient for transformation. Now we're going to look at how the word of God is sufficient because of its essence, what it is. Verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. 
you'll notice that it seems like the psalmist broke from the structure a little bit here. Um, usually in the first part of the statement, he will identify the word of God with one of its synonyms or parts. We've seen this, right? Law, precepts, commandments. But here he says, the fear of the Lord. That sounds a little bit different. We don't generally hear the word of God referred to as fear. So what's being done here? I think, I believe the psalmist has moved slightly and purposefully into using a word that not only identifies the word of God, but relates it to what it produces. So what he is doing is he's taking the word of God, what it produces, fear, and he make, he's making that the identifier, making that part of the word of God. So we can tell by the structure of the psalm that this was no mistake, but that fear is used here as a synonym for the word of God. And it's important to understand what this fear is. This isn't necessarily terror and dread. The fear of the Lord speaks of the awe at who God is and it's, it's reverence towards him. Proverbs 1, seven says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Once you recognize who God is, you will be in awe and you will revere him. And only then will you begin to know anything. So the fear of the Lord is identified with the fear, the awe, the reverence that the word of God produces. And the psalmist says that it is clean, another word for flawless, another word for pure. And he says that this fear synonymous with the word of God is enduring forever, enduring forever. This, this speaks to the essence of what God's word is. It is everlasting. It is without end. Isaiah chapter 40, verse eight says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. God's word is eternal, never ending, never changing. The second part of this verse says the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Here we kind of return back to that identifiable structure and, and the word of God is being identified with rules. Rules, of course, are similar to most of the other ways in which we've seen the word of God being identified in this psalm. And these rules are faithful. They're, they're, they're certain. Paul describes the word of God at times as, in his epistles as the word of truth. In John 17, 17, Jesus prays to the Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Every word of God is true. It is factual. Even more emphatically, in the word of truth, we begin to see who Jesus is because he is the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. The true rules of God, it says, are righteous altogether. The whole of God's word is morally perfect and just. It is by the word of God that we know what is righteous, what is good. This too speaks of its essence, what it is. If we look at these parallel statements in verse nine, we are quite simply just confronted with what God's word is. The word of God in its very essence is eternal and altogether righteous. The word of God is sufficient because of what it is. The words contained in this book are the very words of God. All scripture is breathed out by God. These words are enduring righteous truth because the one that they proceed from is enduring righteous and true. These words are enduring righteous truth because the one that they point to is enduring righteous and true. The word of God is sufficient because of its essence. You must believe this. You must trust this. We talked about how the word of God is sufficient for salvation and the word of God is sufficient for transformation. But if you don't trust the word of God because of what it is, everything else crumbles. 
And I pray that we would all see the word of God as fully sufficient. At the beginning of the message, I said that our text today would show us that God's word is to be earnestly desired because it is fully sufficient. And I pray that you see this, that God's word is fully sufficient for life, both spiritual and temporal. John MacArthur, he sums this up wonderfully when he says this, scripture is comprehensive, containing everything necessary for one's spiritual life. Scripture is sure than a, than a human experience that one may look into in prov proving God's power and presence. Scripture contains divine principles that are the best guide for character and conduct. Scripture is lucid rather than mystifying so that it enlightens the eyes. Scripture is void of any flaws and therefore lasts forever. Scripture is true reg regarding all things that matter, making it capable of producing comprehensive righteousness. righteousness. Because it meets every need in life, Scripture is infinitely more precious than anything this world has to offer. The word of God is fully sufficient. And if that wasn't reason enough for us to covet it, to yearn for it, to chase after it, to desire it, the psalmist tells us in our next verse, verse 10, that we should desire it because it's valuable and pleasantly satisfying. Verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. I don't have to tell you how valuable gold is. Gold has been valued by uh, every human throughout human history across almost all cultures. The U.S. has over 9,000 metric tons of gold stored in Fort Knox, worth, worth over $300 billion. Take a drive in most cities in the United States and you will see signs that say, we buy gold. Gold is valuable. In the Bible, it takes this, this, this object of gold and it even elevates it even higher. The word of God is mentioned in the, or the word of God, the word gold is mentioned in the Bible over 400 times. The word of God is, or the word of gold, the word gold is first mentioned in the very beginning in Genesis 2. The tabernacle and its furnishings that God directed Moses to make contained over 2,000 pounds of gold. The Bible consistently holds up gold as the most valuable commodity. And the psalmist says that the word of God should be desired more than gold, even much fine gold, great amounts of gold. As valuable as gold is, we should desire the word of God more. That is quite the statement because the word of God is fully sufficient. It has the greatest value. So let me ask you something. If I was to put before you this book containing the words of God and next to it, I put um, all the gold that was contained in Fort Knox and said that you must choose one, which would you choose? If you could have all 9,000 tons of gold in Fort Knox, but forsake ever knowing the words of God, or if you could take the words of God and forsake $300 billion, which would you take? The psalmist says that not only should we choose the words of God, but we should yearn for it, desire it above all things. The word of God is fully sufficient, and therefore it is truly valuable, brothers and sisters, even above those things that are recognized in your life as having the most value. The psalmist also says that the word of God is to be desired because it is sweeter also than the honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Honey is sweet and it's pleasant. And once again, the Bible has a lot to say about honey, actually. Jonathan, when, he's, when they're in battle and he's hungry, he dips his staff into a, a, a thing of honey to satisfy himself. Samson desired honey so much that he ate honey out of the carcass of a lion, completely forsaking the laws of cleanliness. John the Baptist, he sweetened up his locusts with honey. The promised land of Canaan is referred to as the land flowing with milk and honey. In the Bible, honey is presented as nourishing, satisfying, and pleasant. 
the psalmist presents this picture and then says that the word of God is that and so much more. The word of God is to be desired because it is nourishing, it is satisfying, and it is pleasant. In Matthew 4, when Jesus was hungry um, in the wilderness, he wasn't tempted to turn the stones into bread. What does he do? Instead, he quotes Deuteronomy 8.3 to his tempter. He says, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The words that come from the mouth of God provide spiritual nourishment that we need to live truly and fully. The word of God is to be desired because it is a valuable above all things, even material things that we hold up as having the greatest value. God's word is to be desired because it is sweet, pleasant, and nourishing. Then we conclude in verse 11. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. This verse, it really returns us to where we started. After showing that God's word is fully sufficient, then showing us how much we are to desire it, the psalmist says, moreover, or in addition, the word of God warns me, it rewards me. This points back and enforces what we started with. So we basically have come full circle. The servant, the one who is under the submission of God's word, is warned by that word. The word of God is sufficient for salvation because in it we are warned of who and what God is. Creator and sustainer, holy, righteous, and just. The servant is warned because he figures out who he is. A creature who has rebelled against the creator, born into iniquity, unable to pay the wages of sin. The word of God certainly warns the servant. However, the word of God rewards the servant. After the warning comes the reward. The servant is told who Jesus is. Jesus is the reward. Jesus has come into the world to do what the servant could not do. He lived a perfect and sinless life. He paid the wages of the servant's sin in his death. He took upon himself the wrath of the father's judgment against the servant. He was buried and raised three days later, freeing the servant from sin and death. He ascended to the father where he is constantly interceding on his servant's behalf, and he will come again to receive his servant. Now that is a reward. Are you unsure, maybe, if you are a servant? If you haven't yet repented of your sin and recognized Jesus as both Lord and Savior, or maybe what I've just said to you makes no sense, please come and see me. Talk to me, talk to another elder, talk to a Christian friend that we might explain this to you, that we might share this wonderful truth in God's word by the power of his spirit. Now, if you identify with the servant here, you are to be in submission to God and his word. The word of God is to be earnestly desired because it is fully sufficient. If you are a follower of Christ, you must be in God's word regularly and repeatedly because it will give you a right attitude about God and towards God. It will result in godly living. This is spiritual discipline. And I'm just going to be upfront. I'm going to be honest. My fear is that many of us either don't think or we don't act like God's word is sufficient. And since we either don't think or we don't act like God's word is sufficient, we don't desire it in the way that we should. Since followers of Christ know what God's word is and what it does, there should be a desire for it. We desire many things in this life, and if we're being honest with ourselves, we spend our valuable time doing a lot of trivial things. So let me present to you a few questions. Do you desire to come to church on Sunday to hear God's word proclaimed? Or better yet, when you are here, are you paying attention or are you distracted by other things? 
during the week do you uh, meet with other believers to open the word of God together, to study with a friend or a small group? During the week, do you make time and then take the time to open up your Bible and taste the sweet nourishment of God's word? As I said at the beginning of this message, there are many ways to practice the spiritual discipline of Bible intake. Are you doing any of them? We're all going to have varying answers to these questions. Our lives, unfortunately, are plagued by busyness. Jobs, school, family, obligations, social gatherings, sports, activities, you name it. And then, when we have some moments to ourselves, we just want to relax. Netflix and chill. Um, I know this because I suffer from it as well. Um, so where do spiritual disciplines fit in? Where does the reading and studying the Word of God fit into this busy schedule? I, I can't answer that for you because this isn't a matter of giving God what is left over of your time. This is a matter of making God's Word a priority in your life. It comes down to priorities and what you value. The psalmist presents the Word of God as something that is to be desired above all those things that you hold near and dear and claim is most valuable in your life. Do you value the word of God like that? My prayer is that when we leave here today, we will be in agreement with the psalmist that the word of God is to be earnestly desired because it is fully sufficient. We would like to thank you for joining us for the Victory Podcast today. This podcast is a ministry of Victory Baptist Church in Hermiston, Oregon. You can find us at 193 East Main Street in Hermiston, Oregon, 97838, or on the web at yourvictory.org.